The House Armed Services Committee's markup of his National Defense Authorization Act is underway tonight. The SASC started its markup last week, but the numbers they authorize and the appropriators appropriate may be all wrong. Brian Clark is senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's former special assistant to the chief of naval operations, former director of the CNO's Commander's Action Group, and writing about innovation tools for combatant commanders in Defense One with co-author Dan Pat. Uh, Brian, welcome. Thanks for coming on the program. You write in this piece, Pentagon spending, uh, according to one side, should grow at least 3%. The other side says the slight funding cut wasn't uh, deep enough. And then you write, neither side is right. Where are they getting it wrong, Brian? Uh, well, thanks for having me on, Francis. Um, I think the, the big uh, challenge that the, the defense committees have is trying to split the, or, fair, or rather thread the needle here. Uh, because if they give the Department of Defense too much extra money, it tends to promote the futurism that's led to a lot of failed programs over the last few years where we keep pushing out you know, to 20 or 30 years when we expect to get the capability we need to deter China. Uh, you saw this with some of the Navy's efforts on like DDGX uh, and even the Ford class carrier. Uh, and you see this with uh, the Army with the future combat system. So a lot of times, We'll give the Department of Defense more money thinking that's going to improve things. And all it does is simply increase their appetite for greater technologies, which require longer times. And on the progressive side, uh, if we cut defense spending at this point, um, the defense budget is pretty much consumed with readiness costs and mountain power costs. So if you reduce the budget, you're just going to have to shrink the military. And that doesn't help us with regard to this competition we have with China and Russia. So do you take comfort then from the fact that, in, for example, in my conversation with Admiral Gilday last week, we talked about the fact that he's focusing on 2025 and what capabilities right. he can deliver for 25. It sounds like, in your view, he's on the right track. Exactly. I think you know, Admiral uh, Phil Davidson, a few months ago, when he gave his last uh, posture statement, uh, sort of rang a, a clarion call for everybody to realize that the, the challenge from China is a this decade problem uh, and not a 2030s problem. Uh, Admiral Mike Studeman, who is his intelligence chief, the J2 at Indo PACOM, um, also said the same thing. So they both said that we've got this problem with China. It's going to manifest itself this decade. If we continue to push out the year in which we think we're going to have the technology to counter China, we're just going to be whistling past the graveyard and open ourselves up to the vulnerability of them being able to get uh, what they want in the near term, either Taiwan or the Senkakus or the Scarborough Shoal, some you know, element of, uh, of the local geography that they've been uh, eyeing for a while. We shouldn't talk then anymore, should we, about a 355-ship fleet? I mean, it sounds, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it yeah. sounds like that's a moot point because that number is a number that we would uh, get to according to the shipbuilding plans in the 2030s headed toward 2040. And that's yeah. out of the scope of, of recognition, it sounds like. Yeah, it, right. And that's exactly what we should be thinking about is, you know, almost putting the Navy or the military services on this wartime footing of thinking about how are we going to improve capability in the near term uh, and stop worrying about what the force looks like in 20 years. So this 355 ship Navy in the 2030s may be irrelevant if we can't deter China in the near term, uh, because it may be that what we see today from China is what we just want to have continue into the future. We're not going to have a resolution. We just need to continue to push them off and continue to con you know, contain their aggression uh, and until they finally decide to choose you know, to focus on domestic matters. So another passage that resonated from this piece based on the conversations you and I have been having for 10, 12 years was this. The Pentagon shouldn't give up on future weapon systems and platforms, but innovations delivering the 20s in the 30s or 40s will be irrelevant for the reason that you just outlined. Right. This means that instead of numbers, we need to talk about capabilities and where we expect those capabilities to execute, doesn't it, Brian? Exactly. We should think about how we can combine what we have or we're going to have in, in the near term uh, and what systems we could develop in the near term, relatively near term technologies that are pretty mature. Um, how can we combine those uh, in theater at the combatant commander's uh, uh, AOR, area of responsibility, to give the best capability to adapt and respond to what the Chinese and the Russians are doing? I, I think we're finding that the COCOMs are where we have to have innovation right now rather than trying to rely on the services to do that entirely uh, because their time cycles are entirely out of line with what the threat is posing. Um, some of the platforms that Admiral Gilday talked about delivering for 25, new submarines, frigates, right. new destroyer, is that the right stuff that we need, especially thinking about the South China Sea and the potential threats there? Uh, it is, um, and that, and those the, those are already in production. So the idea would be let's ramp up the production or sustain the production of those platforms we already have in the pipeline. They can deliver before the end of the 2030s and give us additional capacity. We might also need to rethink or come up with some creative ways to 
keep the platforms we already have. The Navy's looking at retiring seven of its cruisers. Uh, a few of those cruisers probably should be retired because of their material condition. A few others might need to be sustained in some kind of uh, less than fully mission capable condition so you can have access to their missile cells. Um, that's not going to be fun duty for the sailors that are necessarily assigned to them, but it may be a necessity to have that capacity to address this near-term challenge. Um, you use a term to wrap this piece that I think is fascinating, Brian, with the window of potential Chinese adventurism now opening. Pentagon leaders must do the most with the force, they, uh, focus on doing the most with the force they have. 30 seconds left. What does that involve specifically in your view? That involves uh, thinking about how we compose forces in the field rather than doing it in the industrial model with the services providing them uh, up front. So the idea would be, I want to customize the forces that, that the COCOM has, like I customize my iPhone, as opposed to having the forces delivered by the services with no ability to adjust them or adapt them. Um, that's where the innovation is going to have to occur, given the short timelines we have. Brian Clark, thanks very much, as always. Thank you, Francis.